Hello, everyone. Hope you're all having a great week. Um, today, I wanted to talk about kind of a newer topic I've been thinking about. Some of you might have heard that I got a grant recently, so some of this work is related to that grant. The grant is called um, The Psychology of Faith, and me, myself, and Mark, um, another philosopher at Fort Lewis College, have been working on doxastic volunteerism, which we're going to talk about what that is today if you haven't heard of that. So I just wanted to share kind of some of the things we've been thinking about with respect to that and then some future directions it might take. But I am hoping to yeah, have this be kind of an area that I'm going to be thinking more about publishing in and maybe even doing some studies in with Mark. So I wanted to make kind of a video just introducing the topic. So I can okay so I would be really interested um obviously you know you're not sitting here in front of me but you can tell me in the comments how many of you think that you could just decide to believe that some proposition is true so if you think you can that would be really interesting tell me in the comments maybe even you could give me an example of a statement or a proposition you think you could decide to believe and here what we mean by belief is thinking that a proposition is true so um, if you think you can't decide to believe, that would also be really interesting. So uh, yeah, let me know in the comments uh, your answer to that. So a uh, cool little warm-up survey question. Um, this question of whether we can choose to believe or de decide to believe is a question that is very closely connected to this thesis known as doxastic voluntarism. Basically, doxastic voluntarism is the view that at least some of our beliefs are under our voluntary control, or in other words, we can believe at least some things at will. So like I said, voluntarism is it's, it's an existential claim. It applies to at least some beliefs. So actually, if you have voluntary control technically over at least one belief, technically doxastic voluntarism is true. I think it's less interesting if it's just like one or two beliefs. Um, I think it's more interesting if it's at least like a decent subset of beliefs. That'll be relevant, I think, on the next slide. But it's just good to be clear what the actual thesis of doxastic voluntarism is. And then doxastic involuntarism is the view that we don't have voluntary control over our beliefs. We cannot believe it will. This is a universal claim. So it applies to all beliefs. So if someone says they're a doxastic involuntarist, they think we never have control over any of our beliefs. And voluntarists say, yeah, there's some beliefs that I can't, they don't, they don't have control over. Like it's very hard for me to believe uh, one plus one equals three, right? Um, but perhaps there are other beliefs I do have control over. Okay, another important distinction people make in this literature is about different kinds of control. So there's actually a, a number of different varieties of control. And Mark and I, one of the things we've been working on is actually the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy entry on doxastic volunteerism. So if you're interested in that, um, hopefully I'll be posting that on my website. Um, we're gonna send it off for peer review. And once it's peer reviewed, assuming all goes well, hopefully we'll be able to post um, a final version of it. So we'll have a lot more varieties of control uh, once that is out. But here's an important distinction, maybe the most important distinction, at least according to the current literature, although I have my, my doubts about it, which I'll talk about briefly at the end, but that's direct versus indirect control. Okay, so pretty much everyone writing about doxastic voluntarism agrees that we can influence our beliefs indirectly. So of course we can change what we believe through a long process of hanging out with different people, exposing ourselves to different evidence, um, reading certain books, you know, um, doing certain things to influence our beliefs over a long period of time. So everyone thinks, yeah, of course you can to a degree influence our, your beliefs indirectly. That's not controversial. So some philosophers think, I think that a lot of philosophers think, um, again, have my doubts about this, but that the, the real question is whether we can have direct control over our beliefs. So whether we can control our beliefs in sort of a direct and immediate way in a similar way that we can to our voluntary intentional actions. So here's how direct control is more um, precisely defined. It involves two things, temporal immediate, immediacy. So you can choose to believe just like that. It's not something that's stretched out over a long period of time, but something that you can do um, relatively immediately, relatively quickly. And causal basicality. So you can do it without doing something else. So technically, um, 
So there's some books back there. Um, I can make myself form a belief about the first word on the top of page three of one of those books, right? I can open up the book, go read it, and form the belief. But that's not causally basic because um, I'm doing other things in order to form that belief, and it should be something you can do without doing something else. So a, a pretty uncontroversial example of direct control is like imagining a pink elephant. You can imagine a pink elephant immediately and basically. Um, some people use the example of hand raising. Arguably, that's actually not the best example, even though it seems like you can raise your hand just like that without doing something else. But technically, you could be handcuffed. Your hands could be, you could be in a small space so you don't have room to raise your hands, for example. Um, and so hand raising does require a degree of cooperation from the world in a way that maybe imagining a pink elephant doesn't. So I think the pink elephant example is better. Cases of imagination are often good cases of direct control. Um, so it's interesting because when you look throughout the history of philosophy, uh, you know, Descartes and Augustine and Aquinas and all these people, um, it's very commonly held that belief can be voluntary in certain circumstances. And in fact, I mean, there's some historical interpretive issues here, of course, but some even think, um, like some people think Descartes thought actually all beliefs are voluntary. So that's like not even one of the options on this slide. It's like a more extreme voluntarist claim, the claim that we can voluntary control, voluntarily control all of our beliefs. But at the very least, many in the history of philosophy thought that belief could be voluntary, at least in certain circumstances. That has kind of shifted in the last 50 years in philosophy, and now there's this very widespread dominant view um, in philosophy that belief is not voluntary. So kind of interesting. Um, we'll get into some of my own views in a second, but I think um, I think there's a little bit of a dogma here, um, and I think people are a little bit too intense about involuntarism, and I think, um, yeah, I think this orthodoxy is wrong, so spoiler alert. Okay. Let me talk about a couple of reasons why this matters. So why care if doxastic voluntarism is true? Why care if belief is voluntary or not? Um, the first is that some people, so when we say you should believe that, you ought to have believed that, or you shouldn't have believed that, those are common things we say all the time, like people forming stupid political beliefs or people, you know, coming to a qu too quick of a generalization, um, you know, even about like beliefs we form about each other, like you shouldn't have believed that. I would have done that intentionally or whatever. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about things we should or shouldn't believe, that's often what's known as an epistemic norm. An epistemic norm is a norm that applies to belief and is often with the goal of getting at truth and avoiding error, right? So some people want to interpret these claims about what we should believe as what's known as deontological. So let me get to that in a second. Yes. So when we say things like you shouldn't have believed that, some people interpret that should deontologically. And what that means is things like permissions, obligations, blame, praise, those deontological concepts apply to belief. So when we say that belief is justified or that belief is not justified, what we mean is you should have believed that, or you're praiseworthy, or at least it's permissible for you to believe that. When we say that belief is not justified, we, you shouldn't have believed that, you're blameworthy for believing that, etc. So some people want to interpret epistemic justification as in this deontological way. I think it's a pretty common way of understanding it. And it seems weird to think notions like ought or blame would apply to belief if we don't have control over beliefs. Some people deny this, like Feldman famously thinks we can um, make claims about ought to believe and blame and praise for belief, even apart from um, like, like having voluntary control over belief. But I think it's natural to think, well, look, if ought implies can, but we cannot, like, cannot change our beliefs voluntarily, then um, these deontological concepts wouldn't apply to belief. So that's one reason to care. It seems like doxastic voluntarism bears on what kind of concepts apply to belief, concepts such as ought to believe, should have believed, praise and blame. Um, a second reason this matters is that some people think there can be practical or moral reasons for belief. There's also a debate here about whether those practical and moral reasons can affect the epistemic norms on belief or whether they're a different kind of norm that applies separately to belief. So I actually like the, the second view, which is that there's beliefs, 
there's epistemic norms that apply to belief, those are truth aimed. And then I also think there can be practical or moral reasons to believe, but those are not epistemic. Those don't, those norms don't change what you epistemically should believe. It's just a different kind of should that applies to belief. But, you know, you shouldn't hold racist beliefs. You shouldn't hold sexist beliefs. You shouldn't, um, you know, believe poor, th poor, like <laughs> bad things about your friends and family unless you have, you know, good evidence for them, for example. It's known as doxastic partiality. Um, a lot of people think these kind of should judgments about belief kind of in a similar way to an extent depend on doxastic control. So if pe someone has a bunch of racist beliefs, but they had no control over those racist beliefs, those beliefs were just forced about them and forced on them and they had no choice on the matter, at least intuitively, it seems like it's harder to say you shouldn't have that racist belief or to blame them for that racist belief. So um, it seems like a degree of, of control is required to, um, you know, say things like you shouldn't have racist beliefs or you shouldn't believe, you know, believe poorly of your friends and family, etc. Finally, this has implications for religious faith. So I've done a lot of other videos on faith. I don't think faith and belief are the same thing, but I think that they're similar kinds of attitudes in some ways, I think that belief can be a part of faith. And so they're closely connected, right? And, but there's a puzzle here, right? Because it seems like, at least on some traditions, including the Christian tradition, but probably the, the Muslim tradition, maybe even on Buddhism, there are certain things that we ought to believe. So, um, you know, in Christianity and Islam, maybe you should believe that God exists. You should believe certain things about God. Um, on Buddhism, I think it's encouraged to believe like the Four Noble Truths, for example. But again, it's hard to make sense of this idea that we would have religious doxastic obligations, obligations to believe certain religious things, if belief is not voluntary. So really making sense of all of these things, um, epistemic norms as deontological, practical and moral reasons to belief, and also religious doxastic obligations, it at least seems closely related to the truth of doxastic voluntarism. Um, and if you're going to say, well, the epistemic ought doesn't imply can, then you have to give a substantial argument for that, right? Because it does seem intuitive that ought implies can. So I think these are all some of non-exhaustive list reasons why doxastic voluntarism is a really important topic, um, one that people in general should care about, one that also Christians should care about. Okay, so when it comes to, like I said, most epistemologists, maybe not, definitely not all, most might be a little strong, I would say at least many epistemologists are involuntarists, so they think we don't have voluntary control over our beliefs. Um, these arguments really fall into two general categories. Okay, so the first kind of involuntarist is what you might call the conceptual involuntarist. The conceptual involuntarist says, look, there's something about the nature of believing itself, like what it is to believe or what it is to have a belief that makes it so that belief isn't voluntary. So this argument actually goes back to, to Williams. Williams is a, a kind of famous, I guess, person to kick off the conceptual case. I think a lot of people think Williams's argument, conceptual argument itself actually isn't successful. But Williamson's, Williams brought this connection um, between beliefs aiming at truth and beliefs being involuntary that I think a lot of people think that connection holds. And I think that's a, a pretty popular reason why um, people think belief is involuntary. So the thought is, look, beliefs aim at truth. So you can't choose your belief because like once you kind of figure out the truth of the matter, like I see that it's true that one plus one equals two, that belief just happens to me. Um, I can't voluntarily pick uh, to believe one plus one equals two because of the way um, my belief aims at truth. And then they say, look, if you do think you're choosing to believe, what you actually end up having isn't a belief because it doesn't aim at truth in the right way. There's a lot of more specific versions of this argument I'm not going to go into here. We will be covering all of those in our SEP, uh, Sanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy Entry on Doxastic Volunteerism, which again, isn't public yet, but hopefully will be in the next six-ish months. So keep an eye out for that for more. But that's sort of the general argument form. The second type of involuntarist argument is what's known as a psychological argument. So they're saying like, maybe there's nothing specific about the nature of believing itself that precludes voluntary believing, but at least for humans, we can kind of see that we just can't 
believe voluntarily via introspection. Like we can try, but it just doesn't work. <laughs> um, and so like, I'll give a very specific example of this in a second, but some people say, oh, I'll give you a bunch of money to believe this thing, but you can't believe it. So we can't um, voluntarily believe. Maybe creatures with different psychology could voluntarily believe. So again, we're not making this like necessary, like it's not necessary about the nature of belief itself, but it is true that given our psychological makeup, we just can't believe voluntarily. Okay, those are the two kind of arguments. Now I'm going to dive more into the psychological argument and give you uh, more of an example of that. So Bill Alston is a very influential, well-known philosopher, and definitely, I would say, by far the most influential on this psychological argument for dexastic voluntarism. And you'll see, if you look at the literature on this topic, that many people go and then endorse Alston's argument, or at least endorse part of it, find it very convincing. Okay, so he considers questions like this. Can you decide to believe that the U.S. is still a colony of Great Britain. He's like, no, I don't think you can. Maybe you say, well, I'm just not motivated to leave that. And then he says, well, what if I give you a million dollars? You care way more about the money than you care about, you know, having a true belief about that. It intuitively seems like, no, you can't. So can you switch propositional attitudes towards the proposition just by doing so? Remember, we talked about direct control. It seems clear to me that I have no such power. Um, so it's a little that's a, that's a little bit quick. He goes into kind of considering other possibilities here, but I'm not I'm not convinced of this argument, and I don't want to straw man it. Um, but he he does kind of take this, give some error theories for why some people might think that they do have such power, but then say no, they really don't have such power. Um, but kind of really based on I would say at the core his kind of introspective. Uh, intuition about what he can do. Can I switch propositional attitudes just by doing so? I don't have any the power to do this. Um, he generalizes from that. And, and honestly, philosophers have largely gone along with this, I think because probably they introspect and maybe also think they don't have um, such power. But Mark and I both are kind of worried about this. So we think there's some inadequacies in terms of um, this kind of way of establishing doxastic voluntarism. This is very uncharitable. Mark and I both acknowledge that, but one way to see this is like, I experience belief as involuntary, therefore all experience belief as involuntary. Or you could see this as epistemologists experience belief as involuntary, therefore all experience belief as involuntary. And we think like, yeah, I mean, it's not that Alston hasn't at all done anything to try to support the more general claim because he, again, did knock down some um, possible explanations for why other people might think they do experience belief as involuntary and say that's not really belief or whatever. But we think this inference, we need to like slow down and just think more about this kind of inference. Even if some have this experience of belief as involuntary, we should be really careful to include that everyone experiences belief that way. And then remember whoops, I don't have it on there. Remember that involuntarism is a universal claim. So it's about all persons, all beliefs, all propositions, right? And so even as a psychological claim, it's still about all humans. So we, I think to get that strong of a claim, more work needs to be done. So I've kind of brought this up already, but here's a few more specific issues with, I think, Alston's method. There's a little guy sitting in his armchair. Um, the first is differences among individuals. And Alston does acknowledge this to be fair, but I think more work needs to be done exploring this possibility. So we might not all be the same when it comes to voluntary belief formation. Some of us have abilities that others don't, right? Some of us can dunk a basketball. I wish I could dunk a basketball, right? So just because some people experience belief as involuntary, we can't automatically conclude all experience belief as involuntary. Also, differences among propositions, right? So the U.S. is still a colony of Great Britain. Given almost everyone's evidence who would be reading Alston's paper, it's obviously false. What about propositions that we have, the evidence is ambiguous. So it's, it's really hard to know what's true. Seems like we have evidence for P and evidence for not P. It seems like both P and not P are good explanations of the evidence. Think about controversial issues and philosophy, ethics, politics, um, religion, these kinds of cases where the truth value just isn't obvious, why why I think that this kind of argument would apply to those? I think those kinds of cases of evidential 
ambiguity need to be the ones we're thinking about when it comes to belief is involuntary, not cases that the proposition is just obviously true or obviously false. Because again, the voluntarists can say, yeah, if the proposition is obviously true or obviously false, maybe we don't have direct control there. But in cases where really there's multiple reasonable explanations of the evidence that are all sort of good enough to adopt, why not in those cases? So I think we need to consider a variety of different evidential situations and not just cases where the proposition's obviously true or obviously false. Like I said, doxastic voluntarism is an existential claim. The final issue I want to point out here with Alston's method is that the psychological case seems to rely on certain empirical claims. So sure, the claim that you experience belief as involuntary is one you know, we can talk about two introspective access and how reliable that is, but, you know, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt and say, sure, maybe you experience belief as involuntary, but do other people have that same experience? That's an empirical question. And so I think there's really interesting work for experimental philosophy here to say, look, let's ask people, let's ask non-philosophers that haven't um, been biased to the involuntarist orthodoxy. Let's ask, you know, everyday folk, do they experience belief as involuntary? And let's give them different propositions, propositions that the evidence is ambiguous, seeing if they agree with Alston or not. So that's where I said this, this inference from, you know, I experience belief as involuntary or epistemologist experience belief as involuntary to everyone experiences belief as involuntary. That, that's where I think more work can be done here. And I think we shouldn't just assess these kind of claims from just the armchair. Okay, so that's the main things I wanted to say today. I am now going to talk about future directions, and I will probably make some future videos about some of these. So if you're super interested in any of these, let me know, um, and I could maybe make a video about it. So the first question I think that needs to be addressed more, although it has been addressed to an extent um, in some some of the psychological literature, like Tori, uh, sorry, Turi and Corey Cuspano, is do we really lack control in cases of evidential ambiguity? So in cases where the evidence doesn't clearly point us to this is obviously the true proposition and this is obviously the false proposition, could we have doxastic control in those kinds of cases? There is some preliminary psychological evidence that suggests yes, although I think more work could be done here. Um, and I think these results could be replicated. But I do think when we're thinking about doxastic control, cases of evidential ambiguity, epistemically permissive cases, that's like a way I've put it in past videos. Those are the kind of cases to be looking at. Those are the cases we should all be interested in. Um, kind of said this already, but there is also a place to do empirical work, seeing if others experience belief as involuntary in the same way that Alston does. And in particular, people who haven't been... Um, swept up in this involuntarist orthodoxy. So I think there's a lot of interesting work there. And like I said, there's been some preliminary studies already suggesting that they don't, but then some involuntarists have brought up worries. Oh, well, maybe they have these people have a different conception of belief or they're not sensitive to direct uh, and indirect control. And so Mark and I are hoping to expand on some of these studies to try to make sure people are thinking about belief in the same way that philosophers are, and also to try to get at direct control, questions about direct control. Um, and, you know, like I said, everyone thinks we have a degree of indirect control over our beliefs. And so we want to make sure that that's not what people are thinking of when they say that we can choose to believe. Okay, last thing, this is kind of a hobby horse of mine. So I'll try not to go too long. I do not understand the obsession with direct control. So like we said, direct control is temporal immediacy and, um, causal basicality. So you can do it just like that and you can do it without doing anything else. People obsess over this and any example you try to give someone of doxastic voluntarism or a voluntary belief, they say, well, that's not direct control, that's indirect control. And it's just this constant refrain you hear from this, this literature and I find it extremely frustrating. Here's why. Think about actions. Think about Forget about belief for a second and just think about actions that we hold people accountable for, right? Um, not getting their paper in on time to an edited volume. Um, we hold people, people accountable for not eating healthy uh, and maybe not um, taking care of their body by working out in the way that they should. We hold people accountable for not doing the dishes when we ask them to. We hold people accountable for, I could give a long list here. 
notice that none of these actions are things we do just like that and things we do without doing something else, right? Doing the dishes requires a degree of cooperation from the world. It's a drawn out process. It can take, if you have a lot of dishes, it can take hours, right? Um, taking care of your body is a process that occurs over months, if not years of, you know, choosing to work out, choosing to eat healthy, et cetera, right? Writing a paper, same thing, can take months, can even take years sometimes. We hold people accountable for these kinds of actions, even though we obviously don't have anything close to direct control over them, but we have enough control over them, right? And so people just, what they do is they have this super, 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 super high bar for belief when so many actions that every day we take to be um, completely voluntary, things that we hold you completely responsible for, um, we do not have direct control over. And so what I kind of think has sort of happened in this literature is that people have set this bar for the kind of control we need to have over a belief so high that any example of belief at will, people are going to say, oh, that's not technically direct control. That's technically indirect control because you have to do this like little thing in order to form the belief when like in actions, we'll hold people responsible and say they have like voluntary control over things that they have to do lots of little things in order to do. So we don't have direct voluntary control over many, if not most of our actions, but we still call them voluntary. We still hold people responsible for them. And so I think what we need to do is forget direct control, stop obsessing over direct control. You're setting the bar for belief way too high people. And instead think, okay, is this the kind of control I have over a voluntary action? Can I control belief in the same way I can control many of my voluntary actions? And if yes, I think that's a good candidate. That's a good um, variety of control to say that belief is relevantly voluntary. And we can say, you should have believed that. We can hold you responsible. We can praise and blame you. These kinds of things we are talking about when we're talking about the motivations for why we care about direct control. So that's a whole thing I could talk about way more. I'm obviously... <laughs> Uh, I have some some strong views here, but I hope you can kind of see why I find this frustrating because I don't think direct control is all that matters for things like praise and blame. I don't think it's even, um, I think it's way, way too strict of an understanding of what it takes for something to be voluntary. But for some reason, everyone in the literature has just latched onto it. And so it's not surprising that a lot of them conclude that belief is involuntary because they're holding belief to such a high standard. So anyway, stay tuned for some future videos on this. If there's anything specific you are like really found interesting here or want to hear me talk about, let me know. Um, and yeah, have a great day. Thanks for watching.